everyone. It's Margaret Manning here with 60 and Me. This is the place where women who are aging beautifully come to be inspired. And my guest today is John Medina. Dr. John Medina is a developmental molecular biologist. He has had a lifelong fascination with the brain, and he wrote an incredible book. It's called Brain Rules, and it was a New York Times bestseller. He also has written uh, Brain Rules for Baby. And his latest book is Brain Rules for Aging Well, which is, of course, of interest and relevance to us. So, Dr. Medina, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Well, thank you for the invitation, Margaret. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to talk to you. Can I call you John? Absolutely. We, we, because we're buddies. I mean, we've known each other now for, what, five years? So. <laughs> you short, fat guy with a beard. <laughs> well, actually, to be honest, you haven't changed at all. So just for people who are watching this video for the first time, having not seen Dr. Medina's previous interviews with us, we talked about four years ago, and we talked about brain rules. I don't think you had written the uh, brain rules for aging well at that time. Uh-huh. Yeah, just, so, just started it. I'm probably, I'm probably inspired by our questions because we have so many of them. <laughs> Truly, we know nothing about the brain, and you do. <laughs> well, <laughs> we know less and less as we, as we get more and more into it, but uh, yeah. eventually we will. And we know something about how it deteriorates when you get older, so we'll have a great conversation. Well, look, what I would love to start with, and we're going to do a, a chat about other, other work you're doing, but I would like to know, just since we haven't spoken in four years, what has happened with brain research? I mean, what do we know now that we didn't know four years ago? Well, particularly about the aging brain, what, there's a, maybe three things that have become clearer as, since the last time we've talked. Number one, okay. it's much more individual than we ever thought. We thought that all 70-year-olds were going to do this, all 80-year-olds were going to do this, all 40-year-olds were going to do this, all 60-year-olds. turns out not to be the case. It is extraordinarily individual. There are some statistical trends that you can get a hold of, but you can really, in fact, we have a new name for the people that seem to be at 90 uh, functioning like they were 60. We call them welderlies. Wow. Okay. I just saw an image of people with a welding device, but welderlies, okay. (laughs) Yeah. in Northern Ireland to make Titanic. Yeah. Uh, the second one is that we underestimated the great power of social loneliness. And this is a negative. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we, did, we, had no, we knew that if you were lonely and you didn't have a lot of social interactions, that people seemed to be more depressed and they didn't seem to be as do, doing as well. But since we've talked, this has taken off with a vengeance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there's even a molecular explanation for it now that we understand fully well. So it's not just it's a good idea to be with your friends as you get older. You have to get with your friends if you want to successfully. The idea wow. would be to become a welderly if you could. And there's no mm-hmm. reason why you can't, uh, uh, given that there's a genetic headwinds you have to <laughs> you have to face. Nonetheless, you can. But one of the, our understanding of how powerful social loneliness was, uh, uh, we had no idea. And that's that's gotten newer. Also, another aspect, there was a hit of it in the mid-80s, but man, it also took off with a vengeance this uh, as we've talked last. And that's the great power of looking backwards. Nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, you know, people felt good when they were getting nostalgic, and for some reason, for a couple hours, they seemed to be more pro-social and you know, were more verbal even and whatnot. Yes. But man, we'll put that on the map. We actually know some of the molecules in the brain regions that are behind it. And so uh, the first mm. two things I'm saying to you is, isn't that we've discovered anything new, but it's more like we're getting more detail on the variations of the theme uh, 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 for uh, individuality and loneliness. So the third thing is the most interesting to me uh, professionally because it gives us a, an idea of how to look at uh, pathologies as we get older. Um, if you've read Brain Rules for Aging Well, you know I'm pretty skeptical about the whole concept of yeah. Alzheimer's disease as a thing. Yes. In fact, I would like to say the word Alzheimer's disease as. And it's a normally very depressing right. story, right? The, uh, if you get uh, diagnosed, a lot of folks don't know this, but if you, you know, you don't, you never get diagnosed with a primary uh, 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 imprimatur of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a default diagnosis after you've ruled out everything else. Yeah. And it is almost completely intractable. It's as depressing a story, I think, as exists in the developmental literature. But there's, there's, in the last four years, there's some hope. But it, it make, it's, make, it's making us having to rethink a lot about what we feel about Alzheimer's disease as. It's very possible. Well, you know, one thing that we talked about, I mean, um, you're reminding me of our conversations before, because when we talked, our very last uh, almost paragraph or sentence when we spoke last was about nostalgia. And you shared with me the video 
but that gentleman who uh, was in a, a nursing home and he had been played music and suddenly his memory came back and he started singing and all this. But the other thing you're talking about now about this brain, the aging brain, we assume is always going to get worse. You know, that, it's, that we don't have any way of controlling it, of, of uh, inter- intervening. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's not necessarily... I'll just finish the Alzheimer's and then let's get to it. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I was thinking about Alzheimer's and degenerative brain. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm, I'm happy to get away from this depressing story. <laughs> we now think that Alzheimer's may begin in your 20s. Wow. No kidding. And that what's happening is that uh, uh, there's things called amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, and there's probably different types of vascular issues. But it begins in your 20s, and it's, you begin uh, accumulating yeah. bad things, I guess would be the way to say it, uh, in your brain. But it takes a long, long time before you can actually feel it. And by the time you're in your mid-60s and you get a primary diagnosis of mid-age uh, onset Alzheimer's, it's not because you had a disease that just started. It was a disease that was going way back when. So the hope is this, if we can figure out exactly what that is early, you might someday, and I'm not making this up, be able to take a vaccine against Alzheimer's, vaccinated mm, against Wow. So that you begin arresting the bad stuff, whatever that is that's occurring in your early 20s, and you just take it like you would take a measles or a mumps or whatever, and it's just something that it becomes lifelong. Come, so yeah. wow. that, that's new. We didn't think that before. We weren't sure, I guess would be the better way to say it. So. Well, how, do you, how do you know that? I mean, how did you, did you just start um, investigating brains of younger people, thinking that there might be some signs of how it develops earlier? Right. Exactly. Wow. It, 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 a lot of help from a, uh, I, this is not my work. This is the work done uh, uh, on the East Coast uh, for the most part. Uh, we had a lot of help from a village in Colombia. No kidding where they get Alzheimer's really early. You can get wow. early onset. In the, in the mid-40s is not unusual. And so because that is, was such a big locus of activity, getting this very unusual uh, behavioral spike immediately, that, of course, pricks up the ears of any good geneticist. And a lot of people went down there and started asking, well, what's up with that? How come you're getting it early? You know? Yeah, and interesting. 60 and 70-year-old, and they saw, they started going then younger and younger, you know, you're starting to accumulate bad proteins, bad stuff stuff when you're 19 and 20. And so that then led to a whole series of other investigations, which has led to a tool where we can actually take, you can take an antibody in your, and it's part of an imaging system and that antibody will actually bind to a bad protein if you've got it. Okay. Does that make sense? So you should be able, if Alzheimer's was a disease of old age, you should be able to give that antibody to a 19 year old and see nothing. Exactly. Well, that's pretty revolutionary when you stop to think about it, given that Alzheimer's is a really a major concern in the hearts of so many older women and men. Well, yeah, and it affects disproportionately women to, to men, as you, as you probably know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, what's happening to answer the question about the last four years, we just, we're reconceptualizing that. That's a big deal. Yes, yes. So clinical trials have failed recently. Since we've also talked, there's been several billion dollars that have been lost by major pharmaceutical companies because they were trying to create what we think was the end stage. It would be a little bit like uh, creating wow. a, a split for an ankle after you'd amputated the leg. I mean, it's useless. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like having a completely different paradigm about what's possible. Um, yeah. I actually I remember in college reading uh, that's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas oh, Kuhn. Do you remember yeah. that book? I I love that book because it was all about the fact that until you change your mindset and think it's possible that something else can happen, you will never see it. Like you, there's another planet out there that you don't, you don't even see it until you say, oh, there might be another planet out there. Fascinating. That should be required reading in any college. <laughs> Do you? Oh, I, isn't it funny? It stayed with me all these years. It's a great book. So we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot, but what about memory? Because there's memory. Look at that fantastic memory I just displayed there for my age, for my age. What, what's happened with memory? As we go, that improved memory, if you like. Yes. Uh, there's some good news and some bad news. Okay. This is the really good news. Not all memories deteriorate with age. They don't. Um, your vocabulary actually slow, shows a slight uptick. Your semantic memory, which is a memory for facts, that can, believe it or not, even though you feel like you're going to have a tip of the tongue problem and I can't remember this anymore, actually, when we put you in the laboratory, you're pretty good at it. You know? You actually Interesting. Uh, your procedural memory, which is memory that involves a motor skill, so you're building to ride a bicycle, but not, uh, uh, is does not does not. No. <laughs> I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, even simple things that you like, you're standing there like, how do you do that? You know, like, what's it happen? something recently happened to me with this and it was like, oh, I came back from, it, from my trip and I went to plug in my, um, um, my modem and I was like, where's the plug? And I've forgotten it. It's on the wall. I mean, how silly is that? Because it's not on the ground. It's, not, it's on the wall. And I was like, what happened? Anyway, procedural memory falls apart. Well, well procedural, that, that's not procedural memory. Uh, oh, is, is a series of reflexes that you learn, like riding a bicycle. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> then I'm okay. Does that make sense? So repetitive yeah. things. Are okay, I understand. Utilize. And that doesn't erode. In fact, even if you get Alzheimer's, procedural memory often stays pretty intact. Wow. You can remember to walk, for example, until you're dead. Uh, that kind of thing. So yeah. procedural memory, it, it, it can be a, 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 a better. The coolest thing, though, <laughs> that you literally do, and I'll, I'll define this because you know I'm a pretty grumpy scientist, but as you get older, you really do become wiser. And what's interesting about that is that you have, because not all memories fade, you have access to a richer fund of knowledge mm. than someone who is younger than you. As a result, you have more things to compare. And the first thing that does, because, because it's larger and it takes a little longer to take the database, it slows you down. It looks like you're contemplating. Well, it's just access time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> people can think, oh, I'm so much wiser. No, that's fine. You have a richer fund of knowledge to go by. But what that does is that it also gives you comparing points. So when you do access and bring up the memory because you have sit there and thought about it for a period of time and yes. accessing it, you become less impulsive. <laughs> More thoughtful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to use the word thoughtful. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you have, you have, and we, in our culture, call that wiser. It takes longer to do, for sure, but it's an inventory issue. And almost since so many mistakes uh, in our youth are made because we just went too fast, slowing you down, not only, it's not only that, you have, that you're slowing down, but you have access to a greater uh, fund of comparison. So you can say, right. have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And Margaret, that gets better when you get older. <laughs> this is a good thing. You become a better, you know, there you go. But when you think about it, when you're younger, you're actually experiencing things always for the first time, often for the first time, you know, because the first time you did this or that. And by the time you get to be 65, you've done, or 60, whatever, you've done things many times. Like you've tried it once and you didn't really like it. You tried it again. And you, then yeah. you've got, like you say, more to, tr to pull on. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a very interesting study. If you really wanted to improve, and we can talk about improvement later for sure in a separate yeah. segment. Yeah. But, but to stay on this for a second, one of the best things an elderly person can do if they want to improve their memory and have more access to that uh, rich fund of knowledge is to go out and teach five-year-olds. Yeah. No kidding. But teach them social skills, teach them vocabulary, teach them. Interesting. That, when you study it, and, and, and you, we're, we're, that's actually been studied, where yeah. older uh, if, uh, people are, are, are talking to preschoolers, the preschoolers are better. They have a richer education experience. And when you film them, we actually know the reason why. The older person is just more patient with them, Margaret. Yes. They don't have mortgages anymore. You know, they don't, they're not worried about their own kids are 30 years old and how am I going to spend the rest of my life. There's a lot of stuff they've figured out. Yeah. Because there's a wisdom there. It actually, and so in the book, I say it, it is logical. In fact, it is brain science congruent to put a preschool with a nursing home in yes. every nursing facility that exists and have those wonderful people that are just otherwise sitting around in their beds or wheelchairs or playing cards get out there and teach the five-year-old social graces. Yeah, that's there. amazing. Okay, I bet you, yeah. I've actually seen some videos where they've done this, I think, in Holland or somewhere, but it, it is quite remarkable. And, and also the children then energize the older people to get up and dance a little bit or to crawl on the floor. And it's a it's a it's a win win, like you say. Well, it produces what uh, we sometimes call decentering behavior. When you get older, there are certain things that are no physically no, no longer going to work very well. So you're going to have to live with a certain amount of pain, for example, arthritis, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And there's things like that. You know, if you just sit there, wake up in the morning and your bones ache and you just say, oh my God, my bones ache, that's centering on yourself. If you have to, in the next hour, so true. have to go to a preschooler and teach them some, you know, some language or something, <laughs> think about your arthritis for a period of time. And that yeah. we call decentering behavior. Yeah. 
Decentering behavior is is a behavioral vitamin for an aging brain. It's one of the reasons why we think if you teach, you actually can improve certain cognitive score, uh, certain uh, cognitive skills. So it would be very good for everybody in your audience to find somebody that doesn't know something that you do and teach them, particularly for five. This is so exciting. Do you know something? I'm so I always get so energized when I talk to you, and it's like you have not changed it with your passion for the brain, your energy for research, in all these years that we haven't spoken. And I was just actually looking at my notes here, and I was looking how you describe describe yourself as a curious scientist, a consultant, author, and speaker. And I love the curious scientist I'm talking to right now. You're awesome. Oh, thank you. Well, I have, a, I have I've, I've been an affiliate professor in bioengineering for decades, and I haven't had a boring day in any of those days in the morning. I absolutely love it. <laughs> I able to talk about it. And th- I'm 63 now, you know, when I talked to you the last time, I was 58. You weren't a 60-year-old yet. Oh, my gosh. Well, look, this has been a wonderful conversation. We are going to talk about your book, The uh, Brain Rules for Aging Well, in another video. But I want people to know that you can go up to Dr. Medina's website, which is medinascientific.com. MedinaScientific.com. And we'll also put it on the video here. And of course, the book is, is Brain Rules for Aging Well. But I would also suggest you take a look at Brain Rules, just the very first book that Dr. Medina wrote, because honestly, it's, it will change your, your uh, way you think about your brain. It will it'll make you feel really positive about it. So, <laughs> but thank you again for your time. And we're going to talk again about some other topics, but it's been so wonderful. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Our Patreon supporters help us to make a bigger difference in the lives of women over 60 all around the world. They get exclusive videos, live video shows, discounts, and much more. So please look for the link on this page. It is somewhere down here, up there. (laughs) And join our tribe of women in our 60 and Me community who are actually making a big difference in the world, challenging aging stereotypes. So thank you so much for your support.